Our next speaker is going to talk to the issues of putting wildlife, um, the, the, I'm sorry, dealing with climate change uh, and its impact on wildlife management. And our speaker is uh, Anthony Barnaski, who is the professor of integrative biology and curator at the Museum of Paleontology, University of California in uh, Berkeley. Um, my question is, if it's really such a problem for the polar bears, why didn't they commit to a reduction of their emissions um, at the time of the Kyoto Protocol? I don't think the polar bears were at the meeting. Um, well, it, it's, it's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I want to obviously start off by thanking Bob and Jan and, and uh, Shauna for putting this all together. Um, I'm, I'm going to pick up on the themes we've heard earlier today, that we really need to be thinking about how we deal with wildlife management in a different way these days, because we have some very new problems, uh, some of which we've heard about, and a very big problem that I think um, is just coming on the horizon in the land management community is, is how do we deal with climate change, what are the anticipated impacts, and so on. When we think about wildlife impacts of climate change, we tend to think about what's going on in our backyard, how are we going to save this species or that, but um, really all that's standing between where we are today and this <laughs> is how we deal with this wildlife issue in the face of climate change. Now, the sixth extinction, uh, you know, that, that is something that refers to the extinction crisis that people have noticed that we are in really for a couple of decades now. Um, and I come at this from a, a paleontology perspective. That's, that's what my training is. So when I think sixth extinction, uh, well, obviously sixth extinction refers to this is the sixth in Earth history, there were five previous ones. These things are the big five mass extinctions, which can be characterized by wiping out 75% of Earth species in a geologically short time, okay? So now the fair is we're going into the sixth. As a paleontologist, I, I was actually a little skeptical of this, you know? This sounded kind of dramatic. So pulled together a group of people, and we said, all right, let's come up with ways to compare this current extinction crisis with what, has, uh, with, with what went on during these past big five extinctions. How far down that extinction path are we? How long would it really take us to get there if we kept going with business as usual? So uh, this, this just came out last week, and it's actually received quite a bit of, of press. Um, because it turns out it's a good news, bad news story. Um, I want to set this extinction thing where we are in context just to give you a sense of how important it is that we manage wildlife in the right way, uh, and particularly in regards to climate change. So, all right, so this is my little extinctionometer, okay? Um, we're going from 0% extinction of, of Earth species here to 100% over there. And um, what you see here, all these different numbers and icons, are the groups that the IUCN has assessed for extinction risk. Not all of them, but, but some of the primary ones. And first I want you to notice the good news on this, okay? So here's, here's a real mass extinction. 75% of species go extinct. Those are the big five over there. Um, here's where we actually are today. In assessed groups, only a couple percent of species are known to have gone extinct in the past 500 years, give or take. That's great news from my point of view, because it means we still have most of Earth's biodiversity out there to save, okay? This is not a lost cause by any means. Um, okay, now let's talk about the bad news. The bad news are these black icons and numbers and those are the percentage of species in each of those groups that the IUCN currently considers at risk of extinction. Those are the threatened species. 
Um, and if you begin to look at these numbers, you see that we're talking a range, generally 20 to 50 percent of species, depending on which group you're in, uh, are at risk of extinction. And by at risk of extinction, uh, that means um, disappearing off the planet within a few of their generations. Okay. All right. So that's where we are. Now, how do you compare that with the, with the past big five? And this is kind of an illustrative thing to do. Um, don't worry too much about all the details on this chart, but just notice a couple of things. All right. We're plotting extinction rates here uh, against the time over which we measure extinction. Um, and all you really need to know is that no matter what time you measure extinction over, this yellow area sort of defines the range of normal for extinction rates over millions of years, over hundreds of years, over thousands of years, over one year. Okay, so we're going normal rates over millions of years here to normal rates over one year out here. Yellow area is where we can be with no, no big problems. Um, now, what if we get rid of all those threatened species that the IUCN has considered at risk? Well, there's where we are. Rates so far outside the range of normal uh, that, in fact, we would see one of these um, mass extinctions, if you will, in as little as 300 to 2200 years, depending on how you do the number. So that's not very long especially the lower end. Um, and, and again, you know, here's our extinction amometer, uh, extinction rate. This is where we are today, these yellow dots, these light yellow dots with what's already gone extinct. You can see that even at those extinction rates, we are actually moving at much faster rates of extinction than any of the extinction rates, range of reasonable rates that produced any well, at least four out of five of these mass, past mass extinctions. Fifth one is the dinosaur extinction, which could have been very rapid because we think a big rock hit the earth as it fell out of the sky. Um, anyway, that, that gives us something to worry about. Um, now, climate change. Those rates that we're seeing today uh, and what has led species to become threatened actually don't include climate change, all right? So right now we've got sort of a, a, what I refer to as the gang of four acting towards pushing us towards extinction. These first three, habitat fragmentation, invading species, growing human populations, we've known about for a long time. And that's what's got us to the point we are today. Throwing this onto the mix, unusual climate change, um, puts us in a whole new ballpark. And just to get a sense of that, I'm going to briefly show you some pictures that uh, talk about these first three, and then I'll spend the rest of the time talking about climate change itself. Okay, so habitat fragmentation, we've heard a lot about that. Here's how severe habitat fragmentation is, okay? What you're looking at is Yellowstone Park from outer space. You can see the western boundary of Yellowstone Park if you're orbiting the Earth. Inside the park, natural habitats for species. Outside the park, uh, no natural habitats are very few. Um, now, you can imagine, you change climate in this park, species try to migrate to keep pace with climate, and boom, they hit a brick wall. All right, so that's the problem with habitat fragmentation and when you throw climate change on it. Um, invasive species. You know, we tend to uh, forget that a lot of what we consider as natural landscapes, in fact, have already had their biodiversity reduced dramatically um, by several mechanisms, one of which is invasive species. So this is uh, a place where I've done a little bit of work in South America. Um, here's Argentina on this side of the mountains, Chile over on this side. And, um, you know, it looks like a great natural landscape, right? And uh, believe me, you would love it there. It's, it's a great place to be. But um, there, there are no native fish in these rivers. We don't even know what the native fish were because the first settlers or early settlers there brought in trout uh, and the trout ate everything. 
Um, so there's no record even of what the native fish were in these. Totally invasive fauna, uh, these yellow plants, scotch broom, which is a European plant, all through the back country in South America, as is thistle, as are rose bushes. Um, so that sort of mixing of the world's biota, the mixing of the world's species, means that we're reducing overall diversity because we're taking uh, what used to be endemic plants and, replace, and animals and replacing those by those that uh, do well worldwide. Okay, so that's, that's another part of the problem that, that climate change is operating within. And then, of course, the gorilla in the room is human population growth. And um, these next two slides are kind of illustrative, and the reason I put them in here is because they really show you <laughs> what we are, the, the, the problem that we actually face. Now, let me walk you through this. So there are actually ways of getting global human population estimates going back r really to when first Homo sapiens uh, um, evolved. And so here we're, we're taking those estimates back 100,000 years and uh, running over to about 1,000 years ago. And you know, notice we have pretty flat population sizes for a good long time. Then right uh, prior to 10,000 years ago, we began to go into the exponential increase, which of course is still going on today. Um, that's one part of the story. Now let's look at the second part of the story. Um, up until about 10,000 years ago, we had around 350 species of large animals, that is animals who are on average weighed more than 100 pounds. 350 of those kinds of species. Uh, and you might notice here that as we start to go up in population, we don't go up very much. We lose a few of those big species. Um, we hit a critical point here during this exponential rise and there's a huge crash. We lose half of those species. We're down to uh, around 180 of those kinds of species today. And, um, and I guess this is a little bit of a good news story too because once that happened, I think we're looking at a threshold event here, um, things stayed flat to the present day, okay? So we still have the, most of those 180 species. Um, now, where are we going? And let's set that in a little bit different context. Um, again, going back uh, 100,000 years. And this time, what I've done is I've said, okay, we're large animals too, right? So let's just take all of the biomass of the world's large animals, including us, and add it all up together. So this is, you can kind of read this line as the carrying capacity for large animal biomass, what's normal, what's not, as you go through time. All right, so we start 100,000 years ago or so. There's, there's normal. We get that threshold event, which actually wipes out a whole bunch of the lar other large animal species, a crash in large animal biomass. Then it starts to build back up. And of course, now it's building back up with human bodies and with cows and pigs and sheep and things that we raise to sustain us. Whoops, and then we hit um, the Industrial Revolution where we start uh, mining fossil fuels and so on out of the ground and, and becoming very efficient in what we can do and how we can distribute energy through the ecosystem. And now look at what large animal biomass does. We are so far off the charts today compared to what is normal. Uh, and, of course, the only reason we can sustain that is because we direct a large amount of energy towards it. But the point for climate change is this is the world we live in, okay? And it's not just climate change moving a few species around. It's climate change interacting with all of these other things I've just mentioned and especially um, taking place on a landscape that is now very dominated by people. So. It's, it's the interaction of climate change, especially, I would say, with habitat fragmentation that is, is probably going to get us into trouble and that we need to think about new ways to manage. All right, climate change. Lots of argument about climate change. Every time I give a talk, somebody says, how do you know it's real? Well, we can talk about that later, but <laughs> here it is. <laughs> and here's what one of, 
One of the ways we know is because we can trace temperature records not only back a uh, hundred years as, as this graph does from the year 1900 to the year 2000 and projecting into the future. We can take it back much farther, determine what's normal, what's not, and so on. We uh, don't quite have time to get into that. But if we look at the instrumental records over the past couple, well, over the past hundred years, um, and we make a plot, there's, there's what's been happening. Been, uh, we've got mean global temperature on this axis, by the way, time on this axis. Um, we're, we, we are sort of gradually going up. Then around 1950 is when you really start, start heading upwards. Um, and you know, now we're here around 2006, and, and we can continue this. This graph was made earlier than that. Um, actually, now we're... 2011, so we can even add on more. But in any case, um, then these uh, colored lines here are, are projections of where we are likely to end up in the future, okay? And they take into account different scenarios of, you know, what, how rich is everybody in the world going to be? Um, are we going to uh, replace a certain amount of of fossil fuels with alternative energy resources and so on. So you have, have the best case scenarios, which are uh, these, and the worst case scenarios, which are these. And um, let's forget about this because it's not going to happen. This is based on holding emissions steady at 1990 levels. Didn't happen. Erase that yellow line. Uh, we're definitely at least on this blue trajectory, very likely on this red trajectory. So let's, let's talk about how much change is going on in that area of the graph. Best case scenario is maybe at this blue line, uh, we'll, we'll end up at a couple of degrees C warmer than we are today. That's like, what, four degrees Fahrenheit, global average. Worst case scenario is up around um, uh, six or seven degrees. Now. This worst case scenario is more change than took place from the last ice age to uh, an interglacial, i.e. a warm time like we're in now. So if you, five degrees doesn't sound like much, but five degrees takes you from a northern hemisphere that is mostly covered in ice to a world like we live in today, all right? That's actually a natural change. We've seen that happen 40 times during the past two million years. So what's everybody worried about? Um, well, what everybody's worried about is we're not starting in an ice age. <laughs> we're starting in a time that's already warm and we're getting warmer. We're also doing it at a rate that is an order of magnitude faster than what most species uh, you are familiar with on Earth today have ever experienced. Okay, so we're here now um, by the year 20, 40, we are going to be here, and that doesn't matter which trajectory we're on because we see that they're still all together at that point. That's a hotter world than people have ever lived in. The average temperature of the Earth has not been that hot since Homo sapiens evolved. Okay? What if we go on that red line? Earth hasn't been that hot in three million years, and I would say that there is no species that you are commonly familiar with on Earth today that has been around for three million years. Spe typical species duration of most vertebrates is maybe one to two million years, okay? So, so here's what's wrong with global warming. Too much, too fast, and the, spe the other thing you always hear is that, oh yeah, but, but you know, species were around in the past uh, when, when the Earth was much hotter. Well, yeah, but those species evolved in a hot world. Okay, we've got species that evolved in a cold world. <laughs> so the species that are actually on Earth today are the ones to worry about, which gets us back to wildlife management, right? Um, okay, so what's, what, what do, what's really the issue with climate change and species? It's, the way species typically react to climate change is they move around the globe. They find the climate that suits them. Um, now, we've talked about habitat fragmentation, so that's, that's a limiting thing, but um, 
you know, it's, it's the wrong season for this, but I'm going to kind of give you the old Christmas carol story of, of climate change past, climate change present, and climate change future. Okay, so here's climate change past. We can use the fossil record and see exactly what happened when species face similar things. And this is what happened to, um, yeah. this is what happened to woolly mammoths in Eurasia. Um, now, it turns out we know a lot about what habitats mammoths preferred to live in. Uh, and basically, the, the green and the red are the habitats that mammoth preferred to live in. And red is really great mammoth habitat. Uh, green is not so great, but still suitable. Um, gray is, forget it, no mammoths there. Okay, so we start 126,000 years ago. That was a warm time, like today. Uh, and it turns out mammoths are cold, they like cold climates. Uh, so their best range was up here in the far north, um, but still widely distributed. Glacial times hit, now we're at 42,000 years ago. Um, mammoth habitat uh, expands, the favorable mammoth habitat. At that same time, Homo sapiens first comes up from the south and gets into Eurasia. So now we've got the best mammoth habitat just north of the expanding front of Homo sapiens. Um, that holds throughout the glacial. Then things start to warm up, okay? Mammoth habitat begins to decrease again. Uh, human populations begin to move farther and farther north, carry th that through for a few thousand years. Not much mammoth habitat left, and what is left is fragmented by people. Mammoths are extinct, all right? So that's the way the interaction works. Um, there's, there's sort of this, this synergy effect. All right, climate disruption present. Well, you know, we could say that was the past. Um, I, I would venture to say I could ask anybody in this room to tell me something that's changed since you grew up in an area and you would be able to give a story like I'm just going to give you. So this is one of those pictures that for me is like one of those kids' drawings of what's wrong with this picture, okay? Um, this is fairly near where I grew up. I grew up on the front range of Colorado. This is west of Denver. And I'm guessing that a lot of you have seen landscapes like this. For me, there's three things wrong with this picture, all right? Number one, um, when I was... Uh, one of my first jobs coming out of college is I staked mining claims, okay? I staked mining claims from a molybdenum company, and we would go up into the high country in the summers, um, and we would never think of going up there before, say, late June, mid-July. Too much snow, couldn't do it. Um, this picture was taken two years ago uh, on, in the first two weeks of June. All right, so that's number one thing that's wrong. Snow cover is disappearing to, uh, much earlier. Number two thing, see this little brown uh, streak here? That's a little bit of Utah up in the Colorado mountains. Unusual dust storms in the spring. Um, and the thing that's really wrong with this picture are these dead beetle-killed pine forests. And I'm guessing that most of you have seen these all up and down the Rockies. And if you notice, Live trees up here, dead trees here, nice elevation line, and what's happening is winters are no longer cold enough below this elevation to kill the pine beetle larvae, so explosion, uh, and wholesale change in these landscapes, okay? And you can imagine how that's going to percolate through to wildlife management. All right, climate change future. Here's the kind of thing people are really worried about. Um, this is not like the normal climate change map you see where the red shows you where it's getting hotter, okay? This is a different kind of map. This shows you how different will climate be compared to that place on Earth today. So red just tells you climate will be very, very different in that place compared to what it is today. Uh, the lighter colors say it'll be a little different, but not too much different. Now. You've got uh, four panels here. Uh, the, the A panels are best case scenarios, uh, sorry, are worst case scenarios. 
B panels are best case scenarios based on those different uh, climate change graphs I showed you earlier. Um, and then um, horizontally here, the, you've got novel climates versus disappearing climates. So the way to read these is in this picture, for example, these red zones are going to be places on Earth that in the year 2080 will very likely have a climate that exists nowhere on Earth today. That's a novel climate. Um, by the same token, in this lower panel, disappearing climates, those red zones are places on Earth that in the year 2080 will have, uh, there will not be the climate that is found there today existing anywhere on Earth. Okay? Now, um, notice, <laughs> this is in our hot spots of biodiversity. This is where most of the species uh, that occupy Earth live. Um, and um, there's also a good swath of places to worry about in the American West. Uh, what happens when you get a novel climate or a climate disappears? Well, we're seeing it happen already with animals like this. Um, people have heard the pika story before. Pikas are these little guys, relatives of rabbits. Uh, they have actually a very good prehistoric record going back 10,000 years or so. That's all these black dots um, where pikas used to live uh, when climate in those areas was cooler but no longer live today. Um, these, all the other colored dots are where pikas have been trapped since, uh, say, the year 1900. And these um, red dots are places where pikas have disappeared in the past 50 years. Now, pikas are animals that have a very strict physiological tolerance. They just can't handle hot weather. So they usually live on mountaintops. And where they're disappearing is off the mountaintops that are getting warmer and warmer and warmer. So that's what disappearing climates does. Uh, you know, say, same issue with these guys in Southern California, which is kind of a interaction between the warming climate and habitat fragmentation. Um, all right, so, so that um, sounds grim, right? <laughs> so I, I brought you down. <laughs> and now, now let's go back up, because all is not lost, all right? There are things we can do as wildlife managers. Um, and we're doing some of those already. This is another sort of uh, good news, bad news slide. And, and the good news is people really value wildlife and nature all over the world. Um, there is approximately 12% uh, of Earth's land surface that already is set aside in some sort of, of nature reserve. And you know those are the darker areas on the map. And, and we're not actually in too bad shape in the western US. Um, so one of the things, obviously, to, to, to help with this is what we've heard about this morning. We need to keep what we have. We don't want to lose any of those, those places. We want to connect it up, taking into account how climate is going to change. Um, but <laughs> there's a new thing that is really on the horizon here that we have to take into account as we develop our land management strategies in the future. And this little story about Joshua Tree National Park just perfectly sums it up, right? So Joshua Tree was in part set aside because of these very cool Dr. Seuss trees. Those are Joshua Trees. Um, if we go back uh, 10,000 years ago, the climatically suitable space for Joshua Trees was very widespread. Um, 20th century, the climatically suitable space for Joshua trees is now these green little patches, or, or was then. And projecting towards the end of this century, there are the climatically suitable places. Joshua trees will no longer be able to grow in Joshua Tree National Park. Um, now, remember, this is just climatically suitable area. There are no Joshua trees there now. Uh, in the past, how did Joshua trees get moved around? Well, they got moved around by this guy, an extinct giant ground sloth 
that would eat the seeds. You know, we've seen how far <laughs> animals could travel this morning, the wolverine story. Um, deposit the seeds with a good load of fertilizer, and boom, you've got a, a Joshua tree. Not happening anymore, so now we're the giant ground sloths, right? So moving species around the earth is something <laughs> that people are talking about more and more as a way to save endangered species and a way to manage animals on public land. So um, this is already being done, okay? So plant example, this is the uh, Torreya pine, restricted to this little part of um, northern Florida today. Climate is changing, other pressures those trees are going extinct. People have already planted them in the Appalachians, all right? We heard about the snail darter yesterday. Um, that's managed relocation. They can't live where they are, so let's find a place to put them. Um, nice African landscapes, right? Wrong, that's Texas, okay? You wanna go hunt big game? Just Google big game hunting Texas. Um, you'll find these very pictures and you would have the chance to go down there. You know, that sounds like crazy ideas, right? But that is actually increasing the geographic range of endangered species. Um, and then there's very wild ideas like uh, let's put elephants and lions out on the Great Plains again. Uh, that's all a form of managed relocation. So is that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, it's probably not a bad idea for keeping species alive, but it does mean something about how we manage landscapes, all right? We don't want to fool ourselves as to what we're doing. So I think we need to think about these managed landscapes in a very different way. And in, at face value, it doesn't maybe sound entirely different, but, but it is. And we need to distinguish places we would regard as species reserves that is, these are the places where we are going to keep species alive. We're not so worried about the natural ecological processes here. We want to keep species from disappearing off the face of the earth. And we have, you know, lots of lands that would be suitable for that sort of thing. Um, and in those kinds of places, okay, species going extinct here. We know it can live over here. Maybe we ought to move it. Um, but that's in strong contrast to Another conception, which would be more, uh, you know, I've called them wildland reserves in the past, ecosystem reserves here. But the point is, these are the really special places where the goal is, is to let it change. I mean, climate is going to change in these places. The same species that we see there today are not going to be there. Uh, maybe you like it, maybe you don't. But I think the more important thing is that uh, we don't want to forget that we need places where the ecosystem just does its thing and we get that sense of, of wildland out of it. Um, so the main point I want to make is we have to be thinking in these different kinds of reserves and we're not now, okay? Now we've got sort of a one-stop shopping conservation strategy, which is you set aside a big enough piece of land, you're going to preserve essential ecosystem services, you're going to preserve biodiversity, and you're going to preserve wild places. Um, that works as long as climate stays constant in a place. As soon as it doesn't, on a fragmented landscape and you have to move around species, all of a sudden, uh, what you have to do to preserve ecosystem services is not necessarily the same as what you have to do to preserve biodiversity, and you can have both of those and totally lose wild places. Um, all right, so I'll just wind it up by saying uh, we, we have some challenges, but I actually have a lot of faith in people that when they recognize there's a problem, and that's the key, making them recognize it, they're pretty damn resourceful at solving it, okay? So I don't think this is beyond humanity's grasp at all. Um, there's different challenges in different arenas. Uh, you know, the, we, we have scientific challenges. Um, what, what are the right species? Whoops, what are the right species to uh, 
move around and how do we even know they're threatened by climate change. We've got these management issues and, and we've got the, the legal issues as well. Um, is, is the Endangered Species Act uh, going to be as applicable in preserving ecosystems in the way things are changing? These are all, all questions we need to address here. Um, Okay, so I'll, you know, I'll, I'll close it off because I'm about out of time. And since this is the Stegner Symposium, um, these are three of my favorite words from Wallace Stegner, which is the geography of hope that uh, this was in his wilderness letter where he was talking about how we need these wild places, uh, even if we never do more than look into them because um, that's part of humanity's geography of hope. And, and I would say that's absolutely right. You know, we do have a geography of hope out there. It's all these different parcels of land that we have worked to preserve. Uh, all are trying to do different things now. Um, and I think we just need to think about those parcels in different ways in this new world we live in. And, and that's what our geography of hope really is. So thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, countries, you know, preserve the rainforest and so on? Um, <clears throat> do I think we could do, we could assist other countries to save their resources such as rainforest? Well, sure. I mean, I think that one thing we can do, probably the most important thing we can do to assist other, other countries is to have our own house in enough order so that we're leading by example. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, you know, we have a lot more resources in this country than a lot of these other places in the world that are in danger um, have. So directly providing resources and expertise, that's another thing. But you know, I think these things really do have to start at the grassroots level of the people that are living there because as we all know when it comes down from the top it tends to be uh, a much bigger fight than if people living in the area see the importance of it so I would say the third part of that equation is lots and lots of on the ground education and working with these people to show them the benefits and the extent of the problem Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Chan. I'm at the biology department here. Um, Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, regarding extinction rates, uh, we looked at extinction, historic extinction rates in birds since 1500. And um, when you just look at plain extinctions, you get about 150. But uh, when you factor in uh, the fact that um, a lot of birds disappeared, before going with you know before being discovered so we uh, figured in discovery uh, years then the, uh, approximately you end up with about 500 historic bird extinctions mm -hmm. since 1500 and considering that birds are the best known group we think you know uh, you know currently roughly 99 percent are discovered not counting splits uh, of you know subspecies becoming species um, you know, the, it's likely that with other groups, the real historic extinction rates are uh, much higher up to maybe a, a, a factor. Um, so I think that's one um, comment I had. And the other is um, when I calculated um, bird extinctions based on different climate change habitat loss scenarios um, until year 2100, um, the worst case scenario was 6.4. You are looking at 30% of land bird extinctions, uh, of uh, birds going extinct. Uh, but the other issue is that beyond, it's a quadratic relationship with temperature. Mm -hmm. So beyond two centigrade really takes off. Um, and habitat loss can increase it by 50% depending on best case, worst case habitat loss scenario. And also um, migratory behavior. Migratory birds are five times less likely to go extinct. So movement has a really important component. And again, birds are among the most mobile of all organisms. So 30% of birds going 
extinct under the worst case scenario is uh, is actually a best case scenario for other groups so. yeah yeah no and, and that's uh, you're, you're absolutely right so another point that's well worth thinking about is that what we regard as normal on the landscape today is already severely reduced biodiversity you found that for birds we've done the same sort of studies for mammals and in fact in in the US and it's primarily the western US is, is where most of the data come from if you look at uh, the average biodiversity for mammals over the past 10,000 years um, and then you compare that with average biodiversity over the previous many millions of years you find that what we regard as normal is already 15 to 42 percent too low um, so so yeah those IUCN numbers go from what is really an already depressed baseline Okay, I saw a stop sign here too, so maybe we better stop. <laughs>